he had his gun, so he just swung it open. I start to notice that, you know, the atmosphere feels a little bit weird. First thing he seen was this six and a half foot tall, broad shoulder, dark hair, that freaked him out. We hadn't talked to her about like life and death and what any of that means. She's three years old, you know. So we turned around, suddenly there's a whole tree falling across the road. And she was describing to us that, you know, there was a deceased person uh, that she could see, she could see visually. You're listening to Cryptid Clues, where we tackle the ever-expanding history and mystery of monsters and supernatural madness every Monday. You can find us at cryptidclues.ca for more information, or even check out exclusive content and support us at patreon.com slash cryptidclues. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Cryptid Clues. I am your host, Taylor, and today we're tackling some classic Cryptid Clues stuff with the exploration into the ocean deep. These are particularly my favorite episodes because we get to explore some of the more secretive things of Earth's oceans and discover some new stuff. However, before we get into that, a couple of more plugs. This past month, we tackled a few interesting encounters. We were also very fortunate to have Ryan Willis from Sasquatch University on the show. Go check that out. And additionally, Ruben dropped a heckin' good comedic story time episode, which is available on our feed. So we got lots of stuff for everyone that you want to tune in there. And without further ado, though, let's get into this. So we've explored a few oceanic cryptids in the past. And always something new is to be discovered when it comes to what's under the sea, as I mentioned. And in today's case, not only are we going underwater, but we're going to step back about 200 years ago to the specific date of 1740. We have a man named George Wilhelm Steller. He was on board a ship called the St. Peter, which was captained by a man named Vitus Bering. And so this ship was set to travel north for an expedition, an expedition of great importance as it was set to define Europe's relations in the North Pacific for the next few centuries. And when I say that, I mean through discovery and expansion of current world empires like Russia and the discovery of Alaska and so forth. So lots of new things coming into into humanity's fold. Now, George Wilhelm Steller was a naturalist and throughout the expedition was documenting dozens of new species. Most discovered species had the name Steller attached to it, and rightfully so. I mean... I would absolutely sneak in my name, Taylor, if I discovered a new species. That aside, though, most stellar named creatures seemed prone to extinction, which has attracted the belief from modern day naturalists that stellar named creatures are genuinely unlucky. Now, there are a few that are still okay. Uh, the stellar seabird is okay, <laughs> but a lot of other of these creatures were sadly either hunted by humans or just died out due to natural causes. Very unfortunate, but they were discovered. So we have the Pacific Ocean, a naturalist, and a world of newly discovered species. Most were well documented and recorded, except one, the stellar sea ape. And I quote, the animal was about two L's long, about six feet. The head was like a dog's head, the ears pointed and erect, and on the upper and lower lips, on both sides, whiskers hung down. The body was longish, round, and fat, and the skin was covered thickly with hair, gray on the back, and red, whitish on the belly. But in water, it seemed to be all red and cow-colored. End quote. Now, officially, George dubbed it the Simnia Marina Danica, and based on the description I just read, you might think of a seal. I mean, that's what I first think of when I was exploring that, but there are certain other things that kind of shift it out of that seal-like category, but the fact remains that not a single notable sighting of this creature has really taken place in modern times. It, it seems to be that Stellar's first observance couple others have appeared, and I'm going to detail those as well in this episode, but now that ship was subject to a terrible fate as we move on into what happened here. Heavy storms wrecked the St. Peter, and most of the crew did not survive. 
the ones who did manage to last for multiple months before finally getting out of there throughout much tribulation. Uh, ultimately, Stellar would not make it on his voyage to St. Petersburg. And so his notes and findings were officially publicized after his death. Although, that did not include the sea ape. Now, of course, many sea legends became prominent tales of interest a couple of centuries ago. Krakens, sirens, hydras, giant squids, which have been proven real. But yet again, in that notion, not a group of deckhands or sailors spitting off sea monster mayhem were kind of attached to this sea ape, but it was a genuine scientific practitioner with a wholehearted intention of documenting new species. And I find that very, very credible. So let's examine this situation a little bit further. This marine mammal had no limbs, a thick fur coat, tail fins like a shark, and a pleasantly playful and curious attitude, similar to that of a monkey, is what was reported. And the whole encounter lasted for over two hours. That is a very long time to gather information and to really form a distinct opinion on something being a seal, a whale, and kind of allotting into its own category. Two hours. Now, it concluded when Stellar reportedly opened fire in an attempt to kill the creature only for collection and cataloging purposes. Rightfully so, if I was being shot at, I would flee as well. And as far as location goes, the Shumagan Islands, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, near Alaska is where this cryptid was spotted. This is... Around a group of 20 islands in the Aleutians East Borough, which is south of Alaska's mainland. The four largest islands are named Unga Island, Popoff Island, Korovan Island, and Naga Island. These islands were named Shumigan after Nikita Shumigan, who was uh, one, of, one of the sailors actually on Vitus Bering's 1740s expedition on board the St. Peter. They also unfortunately succumbed to scurvy on the voyage, one of the victims that did not make it. They were buried on the Naga Island, however. Now, after some further digging, I managed to find another encounter reported by Carl Shakar, and I quote, Lying in the water close off the port bow was what seemed to be a five-foot-long animal with four to five-inch-long reddish-yellow hair, and a head more like a dog than seal-like, whose dark, intelligent eyes were placed close together rather than set laterally on the head like a seal's. Indeed, Henry Holm, the Smeaton's friend aboard their catch, stated it had a face rather like a Tibetan Shih Tzu terrier. With drooping Chinese whiskers as the vessel drew near, this maritime mandarin made a slow, undulating dive and disappeared beneath the ship. No one spied any limbs or fins. Their observation of it had lasted 10 to 15 seconds, and they have remained convinced that it was not a seal. Although sea otters occur in these waters, this creature did not resemble any sea otter previously spied by them either. End quote. It just makes me think of almost uh, the, the symbolic Chinese dragons you see in parades and, and such, but moving on, Carl Shakar also noted that, and I quote, it seems highly improbable that any wildlife observer is experienced and as meticulously accurate in chronicling his observations afterwards as Stellar would fail to recognize it as a type of seal or otter if this is truly all that it was, end quote. And absolutely valid and notable. What that means, and I know it's a little bit convoluted, but what that means is a man prominent in his line of work with the experience to make a proper deduction and classification should be able to identify what he's viewing, you would think. This is hand in hand what I mentioned before. You have two hours or something. I feel like you can make a proper deduction on what you're looking at. And like I mentioned before, it suggested that the sea ape could be an Arctic species of leopard seal or perhaps is another misidentified cryptid. I'm trying to branch this out and try to keep an open mind and not just go, hope, oh, yeah, boom. It's a confirmed sea ape because there's absolutely a small margin of error and a small margin of misidentification. And I think it's the fact that a misidentified cryptid is very interesting because you could be out in the bush and maybe think you're seeing a Bigfoot. Sure enough, it's a dog man. So misidentification spreads across all areas. And in this case, the long neck fits 
Description wise, you can think of the Loch Ness monster Nessie. It has a long neck, like the classic plesiosaur look to it. However, it didn't start appearing in reports until the late 19th century. So we have another suspected culprit, uh, the Mer- Mirror Horse. Uh, it also has a relatively long neck, a mane, large eyes to it as well. And it's speculated that it actually survives at a semi abyssal depth and is fully nocturnal. Those are just some quick fire alternatives, and I, I'm more inclined to say that this is probably its own thing and not necessarily uh, an alternative, different cryptid. I just like to include that because I like to open up and and spread down different directions. Back to the sea ape in question, though. Again, one more possible sighting coming from sailor Miles Smeaton in 1969. Now, this goes very much hand in hand with the last encounter sighting that I had mentioned. Smeaton records the, this entry into his book, Misty Islands, with a description that closely matches Stellar's. Having been spotted by Smeaton, his daughter Cleo, and his friend Henry Combe, who we mentioned before, All reportedly spotted a creature similar in appearance to Stellar's on the northern coast of Atka Island. Now, this is the largest island in the Andronoff Island chain of Alaska. Atka Island is west of the Shemigan Islands that we discussed earlier. It has a distance of about 611 miles, 984 kilometers between the two uh, island chains. So since we're on the topic of seals... A seal actually can travel 60 to 70 miles, 75 miles per day. And you have to take into effect eating and and stuff like that that slows it down. But you can kind of use that and do a quick uh, calculation and see that that's not a very long distance to travel for for, uh, a sea mammal. So very plausible that our cryptid friend is island jumping between the two areas. But we can also dismiss the fact that in, in general, this is a large area and it could quite easily be home to a few of these things. And it so happens that in between these two islands is more islands, <laughs> dubbed the Aleutian Islands. But I want to hone in on what is just adjacent to the, the uh, islands, the Aleutian Trench, particularly. This is a subduction zone where you have two tectonic plates, the North American plate and the Pacific plate, converging on each other. And as for the trench itself, though, it actually reaches a maximum depth of 26,604 feet, 8,100 meters is what I found. The deepest point in Earth's ocean that has recorded thus far is beyond 35,000 feet in the Mariana Trench. It's something we've talked about before. So we have less than a 10,000 feet difference. That is still an exceptional amount of space to hide in and roam around in. Many of these undersea passageways uh, between the islands are vital migration routes for whales and other wildlife. The wildlife, particularly in this area, is rich in porpoises, sea otters, seals, sea lions, many seabirds, so a reliable food source isn't hard to come by, but you still have to be concerned about predators. And again, a highlight here is to equivalent my underground highways uh, kind of fandom, I guess you could say, where you have, if you've seen the movie Godzilla, King of the Monsters, you know what I'm getting at. You have a hollow earth sort of deal where um, I guess what I'm trying to say is the ability to travel through uh, and access sea highways, underwater sea highways on a smaller scale than obviously the Godzilla movie where you have it frequented by whales, migratory routes like I mentioned before, just easier access i guess finding nemo would be a good other good concept too where you have the turtles just catching that rift and just going along in an underwater sea highway for great comparison there and i think that that is something that you could look at here where you have these highways that are accessible and people can't really obviously get to them but they are known by underwater sea creatures and they're used by underwater sea creatures and maybe that is a concept here between these islands and you have these creatures just channeling back and forth. It makes sense to me. Uh, but again, it's hypothetical. It is not factual. So in the end, this seems like one of those few cryptic cases where they appear as fast as they disappear. And while I, I found out that more of Stellar's documents were lost or possibly destroyed uh, after seeing the initial cryptid, Again, a lot of the things are not included in his publishings. This area is 
presently subject to many expeditions. Alaska itself houses many secrets, but recently I found expeditions that were basically to drop in and observe, notably one of recent activity that was called the Electromagnetic Alaskan Geoprisms Experiment. Basically, they're dispatched to record and explore the ocean floor. So we definitely have a lot of modern day activity exploring this area, and perhaps someday that will segue us into accidentally discovering what is truly uh, lurking around that Stellar actually did see and attempted to catalog. And let's not forget that when it comes to ocean exploration, a lot of that technology is still very, very new. And it's staggering how much we haven't actually discovered in the ocean. 95% as of 2023 is how much we have not explored of Earth's oceans. 95% has not been seen by human eyes in our entirety of existence. And this is something that I always like to kind of tell my friends sometimes. And it's just kind of, it's just like a humbling feeling when you take a rock and you're out in a boat, whether it be a lake or an ocean, and you're out in the middle of this body of water and you're holding this rock and you drop it down into that body of water, you are the last human being alive for the rest of eternity, infinity and beyond (laughs) uh, to ever hold that rock because of how vast Earth's bodies of waters and oceans and lakes and all of that all combined together are. And that's just staggering to comprehend and think. So you can imagine how easy it would be for something really to hide. Until our underwater technology gets a little bit better and we can really go to places we haven't been to before, I do, I'm hoping we don't do anything like the Meg. And I know I'm par- uh, referencing a lot of movies in this episode, but you know the, those movies paint a, a pretty freaky, but of course very flamboyant picture that's been Hollywoodized of underwater sea monsters and creatures kind of wrecking havoc. But um, you know some of the technology that you see in those movies... That'd be very cool to have. And I think that could lead to a plethora of fantastic new discoveries. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's it's crazy. And it makes me wonder more and more about those oceans underneath the oceans and just how expansive it really goes. And I'm going to have to do an episode on, on Pangea. I don't know if that's really like cryptid like, but I know it's definitely a little bit of a convoluted topic to a certain degree. And I was looking at a maps not too long ago, actually, of just taking in how massive a space Earth's oceans were when you have just this one little continent called Pangea back in the day. It's just, it's again, staggering is the word of tonight's podcast. But uh, that concludes everything for this week's episode. I'm kind of going on a little tangent at the end there. Uh, be sure to check out our social media channels, Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode. I'm lining Ruben up to maybe do a follow-up to his comedic story time because that was really, really well-received. Thank you to everyone that was commenting on it and showing support because I got a kick out of that. It was definitely a nice change of pace and a little bit of more of a chipper note than the seriousness of these uh, attempted informative cryptid casts that we, we do uh, the majority of the time. So stay tuned on our feeds for Ruben's follow-up episode. I am your host, Taylor. And remember, take care and stay safe.